Always. We ask the question. What is the question in the world? Hoće li konflikt na sjeveru Kosova utjecati na proces vizne liberalizacije za ovu zemlju nakon upozorenja Međunarodne zajednice kosovskim vlastima? Šta se očekuje od Srbije u pregovorima s Evropskom unijom? Te hoće li EU u konačnici uvesti oštre sankcije Miloradu Dodiku? Za Al Jazeera govori holandski europarlamentarec i specijalni izvjestitelj vizne liberalizacije za Kosovo, Thijs Routen. Mr. Routen, welcome to the program of Al Jazeera Balkans. Thank you. So it has been a busy schedule. Um, it's something over a year that you've been appointed uh, the European Parliament Rapporteur for on visa liberalization with Kosovo, and we have confirmation of the visa-free regime for this country. Um, although it seems a quick procedure, it took the European Union quite a long time to grant it. Yeah, it took way too many years. Uh, the European Parliament already in 2018 Uh, wanted to go ahead with this, but uh, as everyone knows, some member states uh, had difficulties to, uh, to accept that Kosovo already for many years fulfilled all the conditions and was ready uh, to get the visa-free uh, travel. Uh, but I'm glad that uh, from the 1st of January 24, finally, uh, uh, citizens of Kosovo with the, with the passport of Kosovo can uh, enjoy a visa-free travel, hugely important for young people Uh, for people who want to uh, to go to family relatives for business to uh, to the European Union. So in six months, if everything goes by plan, the visa-free regime uh, will go into effect. You said before that it may happen even sooner. However, now with uh, new security concerns and violence in the north of Kosovo, may this delay it further? Well, I don't see any reason why the uh, recent uh, provocations, the the, pro the the incidents in in North uh, Kosovo, very uh, deplorable incidents, I would say. Uh, provoked uh, also by uh, by Belgrade, but I don't see why that should have any effect on the visa-free travel. It has nothing to do with it. Um, Kosovo, as an individual country, was ready, uh, uh, fulfilled all the conditions, and now uh, deserves to get uh, visa-free travel. So I'm confident that uh, it will go ahead uh, as planned. And I yes, I tried to uh, to get it as early as possible in the negotiations, also with the council. There was also some some uh, formality around a, a new system that was going to be introduced but the important date to focus on is the 1st of January 24 because whatever happens that is going to be uh, uh, the last uh, date the last possible date that it will go into effect uh, so I'm confident that that will uh, will happen the European Parliament was never an issue actually it was a co-legislator who pushed for visa liberalization early on however five member states do not recognize Kosovo as an independent state so to what extent will this ongoing non-recognition affect the final stages of visa liberalization process well I don't think it will usually affect the the implementation of the visa free travel uh, however it is a problem Uh, which uh, uh, more in general is, is, is to me of, uh, of concern. I think these five member states have to think also about their role in the whole process because it keeps on being an argument also for others uh, to, um, uh, to delay uh, engagement, uh, to, uh, to point the finger also at the European Union uh, because people say, look, there are also five member states uh, that don't recognize Kosovo either. So I think these countries have to think Uh, there are different reasons why they are not uh, yet as far as uh, formally recognizing uh, Kosovo, but we need to work uh, work on that. And um, uh, I think that uh, also the current uh, developments, uh, the necessity, the geopolitical necessity of bringing the region closer to the European Union requires countries to uh, set aside uh, possible links that they see with uh, internal uh, issues uh, in their own uh, member states, because this has nothing to do with that. This is about the future uh, of a country, of Kosovo, uh, and they deserve uh, to be recognized as, a Euro as for the European country they are. We as European Parliament already called uh, have four initiatives uh, in the, with this regard, and we will continue to push Uh, uh, member states to, to talk, to, to, to uh, urge uh, also the Council and the Commission uh, to, get, uh, to get this uh, debate uh, going also within these member states, but also among uh, the other member states, because I don't think that this is solely a responsibility of these five countries and their bilateral relations with, with Kosovo. This is something that regards all of us, because we have to come together uh, on this, and I think uh, 
uh, that uh, also the uh, well the recent agreement which is suffering from uh, implementation problems uh, of course but the recent agreement uh, um, struck by um, in the belgrade pristina uh, dialogue also opens a window because if um, eh, although it's not formally uh, about uh, recognition by serbia of, of kosovo uh, eh, the the whole uh, uh, direction of the agreement points into that uh, into that direction and i think that should be an encouragement also for the other uh, five EU member uh, states uh, to um, to really uh, start thinking about this and uh, and make some steps. Uh, one of the one of the states that is not a member of the European Union, Bosnia and Herzegovina, signed within Berlin process in November 2022 uh, a visa-free regime for Kosovo and recognition of Kosovo diplomas, but it never implemented it. Do you think that uh, maybe this will inspire other countries to follow the example? Well, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, uh, um, as we all know, uh, suffers also from internal, uh, internal uh, debates, uh, I would say, uh, even destabilization uh, from the outside, which, uh, and it's a little bit of speculation, of course, uh, there, but the internal uh, discussions within uh, the government uh, of Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, probably have been influenced also from the, uh, from the outside. I think that, in general, uh, for the whole region, uh, it is important that any possible barriers, where it is from visa liberalization, visa uh, free travel, but also in terms of trade, every barrier that we can uh, take down within the region before uh, also uh, countries uh, joining the EU is a, is a plus, because that would help already the regional integration and that could be a, a, a uh, helping to open also uh, the path uh, of EU accession. There is another implementation issue uh, now with the Brussels agreement. Kosovo obliged to the community of Serbian municipalities, uh, but it never happened. Uh, Kosovo officials say it is against Kosovo uh, constitution. However, we have Constitutional Court of Kosovo saying there is a legal space for the community to be created. Well, I'm, I'm not a constitutional expert, so uh, I think it's not, not wise to comment uh, on that. I think we have to leave that also uh, to, the, uh, to the Constitutional Court and the government of Kosovo. What is important is that there was an agreement that uh, also uh, the, the, uh, the government of Kosovo negotiated there in good faith, is ready, I think, to implement uh, uh, its side of the agreement. However, we have seen a uh, deplorable uh, display of, um, well, I would say not good faith by uh, the president of, of Serbia returning a day uh, after uh, uh, the agreement uh, in Belgrade and saying that he was never going to sign anything. Um, and I think that is um, uh, regrettable because the, the deal itself stands. Also, the European Union did its part. It will be uh, part of the uh, accession negotiations for Serbia in their negotiations. And also, it will uh, be part uh, in the future of possible negotiations between Kosovo and the EU. I think that uh, the Kosovo government is ready to move, but they need the confidence, the uh, reassurance also, that uh, this um, reasonable uh, degree of, 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 uh, of self-management, uh, as it's called uh, in the north of Kosovo, is not ever, never going to turn into a, um, a entity that we already have one of in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is Republika Srpska. That is not uh, uh, what we want uh, in Kosovo. Kosovo is an uh, independent sovereign state. Uh, and um, yes, it's good that there will be cooperation among uh, these municipalities uh, in the north uh, of Kosovo, but it should not have executive powers. It should have uh, um, uh, the, uh, the effect and the function of coordination of, uh, of uh, um, yeah, uh, executing the services uh, to uh, citizens in the north uh, of Kosovo among these municipalities, but not have executive powers over uh, riding um, the, the, those of the uh, uh, government uh, and the institutions of Kosovo. Uh, you mentioned President Vucic coming back to uh, Belgrade after Brussels saying he will not sign the agreement with Kosovo and right after uh, Serbia received 600 million of euros from yes. the EU. You, you called it a wrong sig signal from the EU to Serbia under the present circumstances. You even called for the European Commission to explain itself. Yes, well, I, it's already for a, a, a little bit longer that I am critical of the attitude of uh, and the strategy 
of, of the Commission and the 27 uh, member states when it comes to dealing uh, with uh, um, autocrats uh, within the European Union, such as Orban, but also with uh, people like uh, Vucic. And I think that we should have learned our lessons by now um, uh, as a fact of the, uh, the war of aggression uh, uh, by uh, Russia in, uh, in, in Ukraine. If you have to deal with autocrats, you have to be very, very clear. And after someone more or less breaking his word uh, uh, less than a day after uh, agreeing uh, to an agreement, an important agreement uh, also brokered by the European Union, uh, I think it's an insult to the European Union. I think it's an insult to the international community to do so. And then having an EU commissioner representative of that same European Union handing out a grant, the highest uh, grant uh, um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the recent history to, uh, to, to Serbia. I think that's a, a strange signal because it seems that you are almost uh, rewarding this kind of uh, behavior. With that, I don't say that the project where the grant is for is not a good project. It's a good project for Serbia, for the region, but, but the, timing. But but the, the timing. timing is not good. The timing is, uh, um, I would say, um, uh, very unfortunate. So, um, in your view, what should the European Union do more constructively in regards to Serbia and Kosovo? Well, uh, maybe it's good to say also my message, eh? because I always say that I am, uh, although people see that maybe differently, uh, especially in, 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 in government circles in, in Belgrade, but I am a friend of the Serbians, of Serbian citizens. I would not want anything more than Serbia also joining the European Union as a democracy, as a country where the rule of law, where the institutions functions in the service of uh, Serbian uh, citizens. Uh, the problem we have is that there is a government that has uh, almost uh, full control of the media, uh, that has an unequal advantage over others uh, when it comes also to, uh, to competing in uh, elections, and that is notoriously unreliable because we can uh, walk around uh, the bush, but uh, what is happening, for example, in Republika Srpska, what is happening, for example, in, um, in the north of Kosovo, could not have happened if uh, the government of Serbia, in particular its president, would focus on the problems of Serbia. And the problems of Serbia, we would be happy to help them, we would be happy to help Serbia also on its path to the EU, but Serbia has to make a choice, because you cannot say that you want to be a member of the European Union, while at the same time having your government officials also very recently visiting uh, security conferences in Moscow, when you have at the same time a destabilization, uh, destabilizing effect in your neighboring countries such as Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo. And I know that they will deny the involvement there, but it's clear that um, there is a connection, that there is also a strategy to keep the region um, instable, to keep neighboring countries instable. And I think that Serbia, in that respect, has to make uh, a choice. If they do, if they commit to their European path, including all the problems that we know that there are, because it's, 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 it's obvious that there, we have to solve some problems also with regard to the energy, for example, but we're ready to help Serbia. But Serbia has to make a choice and also um, join, for example, uh, uh, our sanctions and our support uh, uh, to uh, the sanctions to Russia and the support to Ukraine. So you call Ser Serbia a destabilizer, but uh, the European Union sees it as a possible leader country uh, to, to bring the whole region into the EU family. Well, but the, the, the problem is that in potentially they are. Serbia is the uh, biggest economy of the region. Serbia has everything to play for. They are pretty far, they were pretty far in their uh, path of the negotiations uh, for uh, EU membership. Unfortunately, the past years, we have seen um, mostly backsliding when it comes to the rule of law, when it comes to uh, democracy. But they have everything to play for. They could potentially indeed be uh, leading the region, uh, not only economically, but also be the example uh, that uh, it is possible uh, to reform, that it is possible to uh, change course, to change uh, direction. And I think that um, uh, in that respect, as I said, the uh, Serbian people, but also its government, has to make a choice.
But how feasible is this leadership role, uh, given the reluctance of Serbia's official to come to terms with the war crimes history with their neighboring countries, such as Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo? We, we have convicted even yeah. individuals of Serbian armed forces. Uh, after being convicted, they fled to Serbia and now they live yeah. freely and openly in the country. Yeah. And they're not even hiding. Well, I must say, and that is indeed a huge problem, I would say, in the entire region, reconciliation is still uh, problematic. Uh, and that requires a lot of courage. And some uh, people have shown that courage also in the, in the, in the past uh, decades. We have to make a distinction there, uh, which is difficult. I understand that and I understand also the emotions in all the respective countries, including uh, in Serbia. But we have to make a distinction People who are accused of war crimes or have been convicted of war crimes need to serve their sentences or need to respond to a court, like now is happening also still uh, in, uh, in The Hague with some uh, accused, uh, people accused of, of, of war crimes. That is a process that is part of uh, coming to terms uh, with the past. Now, when it comes to uh, the current situation, also in Serbia, but also, for example, with uh, Mr. Dodik, uh, repeatedly denying genocide, which is a crime in itself already in the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina, but is not being uh, prosecuted. That is very bad for the whole uh, reconciliation process that we need so badly in the, in the entire region. And it requires, as I said, courage. Uh, and I hope that everyone in the region will take the responsibility, uh, not less uh, also within the um, belgrade pristina dialogue, where one of the important elements, recent elements, uh, is the uh, declaration on uh, missing persons. You've mentioned the president of the Bosnia-Herzegovinian entity, Republika Srpska, Milorad Dodik. He uh, also threatens to rip apart uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, recently awarded EU candidate country status, uh, threatens with secession of the entity Republika of Srpska from the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Yeah. Uh, you also called for a reaction of the uh, European Commission. Was there any reaction? Well, I'm, I'm very, very worried about Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, I was a strong proponent of uh, granting uh, the candidate status to Bosnia-Herzegovina as an encouragement primarily to the people of Bosnia-Herzegovina, because if we look at the facts, uh, no government official, past or present, uh, deserved to get the candidate status because there has not been uh, enough progress, but it was a good sign, I think, to the, uh, to the citizens of Bosnia-Herzegovina. But clearly, also the current generation of politicians, and I must say they were not helped by the decisions uh, of the high representative, the OHR, uh, but uh, the current politicians do not seem uh, to understand the urgency of getting together, of setting aside uh, their own uh, interests uh, and um, well, fighting merely for the uh, entire state of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And that gives a lot of room to uh, Milorad uh, Dodik uh, at the moment uh, to, to play his uh, game that ultimately uh, will be not only a disaster for the, uh, for the country of Bosnia-Herzegovina but also for the entire region. We simply cannot afford to, uh, to have this conflict uh, persist uh, within the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Bosnia-Herzegovina has to come together and, well, I, I think, and the European Parliament already called for that many times, we need to sanction uh, Milorad Dodik and his allies uh, because they are clearly uh, embarking on secessionist, but also trying to rip apart and, well, destabilize basically their own uh, country. Uh, and uh, the US and the UK already have done so, and I think the EU uh, should not shy away uh, from that and, uh, and call uh, also um, um, Milorad Dodik for what he is, because he is destabilizing and in, on top of that, and I think that is a very important point relating to the reconciliation needed in the region, he must stop with denying the genocide uh, time and time again. Uh, so we mentioned the internal threats, but I think the EU uh, sees Milorad Dodik as an external threat as well, since he's uh, giving an open support to uh, pre President of Russia, Putin, he even awarded yes. him a Medal of Honor. No, but, but, but all these events, huh? I mean, uh, if you really uh, think of what is actually happening, this, we are talking about an entity within the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina that should not even have its own 
foreign policy, because foreign policy of Bosnia-Herzegovina is the prerogative the state of, of the state of Bosnia-Herzegovina. So uh, Milorad Dodik should focus on the interests of the entity that he has been elected in, uh, nothing else. And the last thing he should be doing is uh, um, paying lip service to a, uh, uh, a uh, war criminal uh, like Putin, even openly supporting him. And unfortunately, uh, there is a group of people uh, supporting one another because after the, his visit, uh, recent visit to Moscow, where also the head of security uh, and intelligence of, uh, of Serbia and a Serbian minister were present, they all also came uh, to a uh, organized uh, parade organized by President Vucic in Belgrade and again um, uh, shared their, their, their rhetoric uh, there. I mean, if you really look at, uh, at the, the facts, what is Milorad Dodik even doing in Moscow, but also in Belgrade? He should, uh, if anything, be focusing on uh, uh, the interests of his own entity, where he was elected. And in my opinion, he went too far already with genocide denial, with the uh, secessionist initiatives that he, uh, he took. EU will not sanction, sanctionize him uh, because of the internal issues, but uh, there, there are some initiators in the European Parliament no. for the EU sanctions against yes. Dodik because of his open support to President Putin. Well, Is this possible? You, you, you are right, that could be uh, another uh, avenue to, uh, to explore. Um, I, I think there have been countless uh, uh, reasons already uh, to sanction uh, uh, Mr. Dodik and his allies uh, for their behavior and their um, uh, uh, acts in, in, in the uh, entity of, uh, of uh, Republika Srpska within Bosnia-Herzegovina. But if it helps uh, uh, to, to, uh, to put this on the agenda again, I'm happy to, to do so. But the most important thing, whether it comes to supporting, openly supporting Putin or denying genocide, uh, it's unacceptable. And the EU should also at some point take a moral stance on that. And that's what I've been uh, missing in the past weeks, in the past uh, months. The European Union is not uh, uh, vocal enough. Also in the uh, recent, uh, uh, the period uh, of the recent escalations uh, in the, in the North past, uh, past weeks, um, uh, the EU is not vocal enough with a moral stance that some things are just unacceptable, whether it's support traveling to Moscow supporting Putin or uh, genocide uh, denial. Even that seems to be difficult uh, uh, at the moment uh, and that worries me. How do you explain this uh, passivity? Well, I, I, I don't know. I think that, that um, and, and that's something that I'm working on for, for months uh, uh, now, uh, try to convince as many people as possible of the, as I call it, geopolitical urgency uh, to to include this region in the European Union, in uh, um, a, the largest zone of freedom and democracy uh, uh, in the world. That was the objective over 75 years ago of the project of the European Union, to create this zone of freedom and stability. And the countries in the Western Balkans are part of Europe. They are not part of the European Union yet, but they are part of Europe. They belong to our uh, continent, to our uh, family. The task that we have is to make sure that the region does not fall victim to destabilization, that we do not give, open the door basically uh, for destabilization from uh, Moscow or uh, influence, uh, undue influence from China, for example. We need to make sure, and I think that uh, also uh, all citizens in all countries uh, involved deserve that. We need to make sure that they become in the end part of that zone of freedom and uh, democracy and stability. Uh, something similar said also German Chancellor Olaf Scholz recently in the European Parliament. Yes. He said that the time of the EU non-defined promises for the Western Balkans has passed. So just in conclusion, does the EU have concrete, realistic and viable, viable uh, accession process and timeline for the Western Balkans countries? Well, as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, we should do that as fast as possible. And I think the window uh, for um, a quick uh, joining of the European Union for the group as a whole um, is not there at the moment, realistically. But uh, what would help is that we have one or two countries joining relatively fast to also give a signal, to also say, look, it is possible, because I uh, understand the frustration in many of the Western Balkan countries when looking uh, to the past years or even the past decades, basically years of 
broken promises. Yes, we give you the perspective, but then when it came to the moment of decision making, there was always something uh, uh, that was, uh, was wrong or a, a new condition uh, uh, set or a new country uh, within the current member states of the European Union uh, making a difficulty. Uh, that has to stop. We need to realize that we are in a historic moment. We need to realize that not just us as members of the European Parliament, uh, government leaders of the EU member states have to respond to our children and grandchildren. It's also a, a question that people in the countries in the Western Balkans have to ask themselves. What did you do when there was a chance to set a step forward, to move ahead? And you asked about a date. It's always difficult to set dates, but I say as soon as possible. And the European Parliament has been clear. We need um, ideally finish, have to finish this before 2030. But I would think that it would be a strong signal to have one or possibly two countries joining even before that to, to say, look, it is possible. You are part of this family. All these countries belong to Europe and they should also be in the European Union. So the, the modality of the enlargement is actually uh, state by state uh, joining the EU. Which states are the most close to it? Well, that depends also on how you look at it. You can measure it uh, according to their progress in the negotiations. As you know, um, a country like North Macedonia has now opened the first uh, uh, IGC, uh, uh, but is still relatively uh, uh, problematic because of the problem they have to solve uh, with, uh, with Bulgaria. Uh, but I think that North Macedonia and Albania also uh, um, are quite far ahead and uh, could possibly, um, if we also uh, take that political decision, have the political courage to also say, uh, look, we need to move this on, we need to be uh, creative. And a second thing that I think needs uh, to be explored quickly uh, ahead of the next uh, um, period, uh, next commission, uh, uh, because we need also a strong new commissioner that is passionate about the region, but also uh, is uh, strict and uh, clear about uh, things that are not good, uh, like I, I mentioned before, but I think that what could help is also to develop and to explore new avenues such as uh, the, the concept of stage integration. To me, everything uh, that could help these countries to move closer in a much quicker pace is on the table and uh, should be used. Mr. Oten, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera Balkans. You're welcome.